Dr. Frank, how did you become interested in gerontology? I became, became interested in gerontology uh, when I was completing my uh, undergraduate work at the University of Southern California. I was in a accelerated um, bachelor's of social welfare program that you could stay and get one more year of, co of uh, coursework and get your master's after your bachelor's. And during that curriculum, they had an opportunity to take what they called a human development semester. And because the textbooks, this was in the early uh, mid-70s, because the textbooks didn't include anything about older people, they made um, live textbook content by having the researchers and the older adult volunteer, uh, volunteers from the Andrus Center um, come over and, uh, and teach, give lectures, and give us content. And so that really intrigued me because um, as most gerontologists, I love my, had very close relationship with my grandmother. And so I thought after looking at the demographics and kind of thinking about career paths, um, I thought, you know, there may be just a future in aging here. So I thought there might be some good job potential. So that's what really got me hooked, was that, uh, that first undergraduate experience in the human development course. Um, could you, this, um, we're going to do sort of a two-part question. Could you describe your career trajectory as a gerontologist? Sure. Um, I was a um, long-term student. Uh, I um, did my, I, I had already completed two years of community college work in my local community in Central California. And I came down to the big city of Santa Barbara and that's where I met my husband and from there I moved on down to Los Angeles and he felt that it was really important for me to finish my undergraduate degree as kind of an insurance policy and a you know a good uh, good grounding so I went to USC to do that and that's where I did the bachelor's in social welfare because of my interest uh, during that human development semester I got linked into the faculty and some of the older volunteers at the Andrus Center which was where that brand new Leonard Davis School of Gerontology was there for about maybe three years at the time I was there. And so I applied um, to the master's program and I continued on after my undergraduate work into the master's program. And from there I got really interested in health and the impact of health on older adults. And so I applied to the UCLA School of Public Health now the UCLA School of Public Health, as actually many current public health schools, felt that gerontology was an unrelated field to public health. Even though old people are gonna be 20% of the population, right? And it's population-based discipline. So I had to do the whole master's in public health program. And from there I finally got into the doctoral coursework. So um, I didn't complete all of that. Um, which also included bearing a sister, a dad, and grandparents until 1993. And then I you know, started working. And, um, and I stayed at UCLA and I worked in University Extension uh, in doing training programs in gerontology and other health areas. And then about um, 2001, I got uh, um, uh, transferred over into geriatric medicine, and there uh, I had completed my doctorate in public health, and I started working as part of the interdisciplinary research team in geriatric medicine and gerontology, and um, we had education and training centers, so I really developed an expertise in applying behavioral, prin behavioral science principles and evaluation tools into education and training around developing a competent workforce in geriatrics and gerontology. And um, I ran a program, I had you know 14 people that worked in our unit, so I did a lot of administrative work and I continued doing that kind of thing with various types of projects that we competed for uh, until I retired in 2013. Uh, at what point in your career did you embrace gerontologist to describe yourself. Okay. 
Um, when I was in the master's program at USC, we had a very active student association, and um, we used to, we actually coined the term geronting, and that was what we called ourselves when we were you know trying to uh, advocate on behalf of. Um, student needs in the program and older adults in the community and that kind of thing and so we were definitely gerontologists you know it was kind of a shock when I got to the School of Public Health at UCLA to learn that the world didn't rotate around the needs and the and the well-being of old people because that had been my, kind of my center and the Andrus Gerontology Center in the Leonard Davis School is a really special wonderful place to get training um, and yet it also is quite isolated because you really do have such a central focus uh, on you know the needs and well-being and, and research around aging so um, early on I considered myself a gerontologist and once I got into geriatric medicine you know I kind of reestablished that um, identity um, because I was the non-clinician on the team, and I was the one that kind of brought uh, that, I don't know, sometimes social frame to what was being looked at as a medical issue or a patient care issue. And so um, my viewpoint was very welcomed, you know, very interdisciplinary, uh, I think in a very progressive way. Dave Rubin uh, is a just amazing guy to, to work under and I had great mentorship and so um, you know I was kind of the resident gerontologist in the sea of physician centric life there in the School of Medicine. Did you have female mentors who um, impacted your move into gerontology? I did. I had a number of wonderful professors at USC including Ruth Wegg, Pauline, Reagan Robinson, um, probably several others. Uh, uh, I didn't have such great mentorship from women in the School of Public Health at UCLA. And I think sometimes uh, women that are attempting to establish themselves can be kind of hard on women coming up through the ranks. So um, externally, I had uh, many people that opened doors. Uh, I remember when I was in geriatric medicine, my bosses were writing a book on geriatric assessment. And I said, well, you can assess all you want, but if you can't get people to do what these assessment recommendations, you know, are, are then what good are they? So you really should consider having a, a chapter on communication. Communication both with their primary care provider because they're going to implement a lot of this stuff and with the person themselves as to the palatability of these recommendations because if you can't get people to 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 follow the recommendations what good are they and they said great idea who could write it and i'm thinking well gosh i could i could write it but apparently they didn't want me to write it you know they wanted a name so we talked and i said well marcia ori from the national institute of aging has this whole communication work group that, that I've, you know, gotten to know about. She would be fabulous. So he said, great, go, go see if you could get her to, to write it. So I contact Marsha, and I, I only have been on a couple committee meetings with her, um, and she's a very powerful and very, you know, wonderful person. And so I meekly approach her, and I think I'd had my doctorate about a minute at that time. And, uh, and I said, you know, John Beck and, and Dan Osterweil are writing, editing this book, and they, you know, I've talked them into having a chapter about this. And she said, that's a great idea. So what do you think, what do you envision it including? So I start outlining all my ideas, and she said, well, why aren't you writing this? And I said, because they want a name. She said, well, that sucks. Mm -hmm. She says, here's what we're going to do. You're going to be first author. I'm going to be your second author. You're going to frame it just like you talked about here. This is perfect. I'm going to fill in the gaps, you know, add what content I feel is necessary, and we're going to do this together. And that was my first publication. 
So that was a great example of mentorship, and I've maintained a, a great relationship throughout the years with her. Wonderful. Um, and what is unique about being a woman in gender? Well, I think the reality of the multi-generational family and the pressures on caregiving um, is very real for women. And, um, and I, I do think, obviously, men play a really critical role in their, in their caregiving roles. There are definitely gender roles, though, in my opinion. At least that's been my experience. And that's what the literature says, too. So I think a lot of times what han ends up happening is uh, you're at a, a central helper role a as the female. And as a gerontologist, you have to walk that line between knowing it intellectually and living it personally and emotionally. And that's a tough one. And I, I think more and more people, as they age, will also have that, have that experience. Um, you know, I'm a natural connector. You know, I've been described as a connector. So I connect people to stuff they need. I don't know if that's a gender role or just me. Um, but, you know, being in my role and having the connections I've had at UCLA and nationally has been great because you know, pretty much anything that anybody needs, I know a couple people that can help them, and I make those connections. So it's been a really, you know, it's been, you know, it's been very fulfilling from a personal standpoint to be able to play those roles, you know, in addition to, to um, you know, just the productivity professionally that, that I've been able to enjoy and, and uh, experience. How has being a gerontologist interacted with your own personal aging process? Um, let's see. Well, I had kind of a weird experience in 2005. I contracted a very rare um, autoimmune disease. And at one point, um, I was carrying around one of those giant oxygen tanks. My oxygen capacity, uh, lung capacity, was at 38%. So to go from my bed to my couch was my big effort for the day. Um, off work for a number of months and working from my bed for a while. And so uh, the first diagnosis was pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, that's what they thought until they did further testing. And of course, I quickly went online and looked that up, and it was a death sentence. Two years, you're gone. And I thought, wow, this isn't how I thought it was going to happen. You know, I think I was, okay, so that was 2005. So my son was in college, um, and I guess I was in my, well, I'm 65 now, so uh, that was about 10 years ago. So I was about just under 55. And it kind of took me by surprise. And I thought, hmm, I guess this must be what aging people experience. You know, they get surprised with their, what lands in their lap. And luckily, um, I was very blessed in that, partly because of my connections and because of people that helped me, I got some great uh, diagnostic help. They figured out that it was this autoimmune um, often treatable illness, and I was one of the blessed people that, you know, recovered fully, and I'm in remission. So since that experience, um, which obviously is part of the aging process, and people, most people will have some kind of experience like that as they grow older. We hope it's at 99, the month before you, you know, wake up dead. But uh, it can happen at any, at any time. And so the life ex that life experience, um, you know, has really shaped the fact that, um, you know, I have different priorities now. And a big part of that is taking care of myself because I have to keep with my underlying scarring and other, you know, remnants from that disease. You know, I have to really stay on top of my health and fitness. So that's a big part of my life. 
and that reordered a lot of my work because I was the, whatever I needed was the, always the last on the list. It was always what the job needed, what others needed, and then if there was anything left over, I took care of me. That's flipped. So that's part of the process. Um, uh, I was real comfortable letting my hair go natural. And I love Marilyn Gugliucci's saying of never trust a gerontologist that dyes their hair. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, you know, it, I kind of feel like it gives me some legitimacy. And um, yeah, so it's part of the process. I embrace it. You know, I'm into aging gracefully and uh, being as fit as I can possibly be given whatever. And I think that frame is really helpful in working with older people and understanding people have all kinds of stuff going on. But what you want to do is help them do the most important things for themselves. Oftentimes that's maintaining as much independence as possible. And you want to rally around support systems and infrastructure and environmental supports and social supports and whatever you can do to you know, help them do that. And that's what I had to do, and I know how helpful that was. In what ways did you have to, did you have to change that? Well, I had to let go of, um, work-wise, I had to let go of a lot of expectations of uh, being there and being as productive as I had been. Um, I had to take care of me first, or there wouldn't be a me to do anything. And um, my son had already kind of left the coop with going away to college. So um, my husband was uh, very supportive. We just, this year, in a couple weeks, we're celebrating our 42nd anniversary, uh, which in Los Angeles is almost unheard of these days, but uh, lucky that way too. And so I, you know, I, I just had to, kind of wake up each day and count my blessings and write in my gratitude journal that, you know, I can get a full breath and I can do all these things. And, it, you know, it just really changed my perspective on what was important. The WIGL project focuses on the legacies of older women gerontologists. Uh-huh. Within this framework, is there anything else you would like us to know? Well, I think uh, women in gerontology, you know, when you, when you visit the GSA offices and you look at all the portraits of all the presidents, you know, it's not so long ago that you started seeing female headshots in those slots. So I think that uh, the people that were the professional gerontologists and the faculty leaders, the research leaders in the 70s mainly and I think early 80s, the ones that really established things paved the way for us. You know, I think we've, um, you know, we have a lot of work to do still. Uh, and, but I, I do think that, um, you know, our foremothers were really pioneers in the field and you know it was the Ruth Weggs with the biology of aging issues and um, you know the the policy leaders like Carol Estes and you know wonderful people like Lynn Friss Feinberg that's doing such amazing work now and you know all Jenny Chen Hansen I mean there's just so many people that are in these in really important leadership positions that um, I think are just continuing, continuing that good work. And it's pretty amazing because last year I was the president of the Association of Gerontology and Higher Education, which is the educational unit for GSA. And we are all about, you know, workforce development, education, training, you know, uh, delivering quality uh, education programs at higher education institutions, et cetera. Well, while I was president, Ruth, uh, uh, Rita Afros uh, was elected incoming president for, or president-elect, I guess it's called, for GSA. 
and Kathy Alessi, who runs our Veterans Administration Geriatrics Program in Los Angeles, was elected uh, president of the American Geriatrics Society. So I'm looking around, I'm thinking, wow, something's going on here with our leadership that we are being promoted and encouraged to take these things on. And so they actually wrote a little piece up about the three women powerhouses at UCLA that are leading the three top gerontology associations in the nation. And it was very cool to see that. And we each got there on a different path. Uh, Rita is a pathologist that does basic science research about immune systems. And Kathy is a geriatrician. Uh, you know, and I'm this person that came up through the gerontology programs and then got a doctorate in public health and has done an educational administration most of my life. And so we all had our pathways, but we weren't afraid to be leaders. And it, you know, I, I think that more and more women will be encouraged by, by those kinds of stories, just like we were, you know, with the people that helped us.